Hello, folks. This is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchmen Studio B with another Watchmen video broadcast. This week, we're going to identify Satan, Lucifer, the dragon, the devil. Only it seems like throughout history, he's been in disguise. He is the dragon. He is our adversary. He hates us. We hate him. God hates him. He's going to be thrown in the pit for a thousand years. And in many cases, with many people throughout history, he's been difficult, if not impossible, to identify. You see, because he's been wearing a disguise. What does Now, is he trying to look like Buddha? No. He already looks like Buddha. Is he trying to look like Mohammed? No, he already looks like him. Is he trying to look like uh, the Ein Sof from Jewish Kabbalah? No. Is he look, trying to look like Joe Smith? No, he already looks like him. Apparently, he's been going around throughout history, and even today, and in the future, masquerading as none other than Jesus Christ. We're studying Matthew chapter 24. Here's what Jesus said. This is what he told us to look for. Matthew 24, starting in verse 23. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets. We talked about that. And shall shew great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive. Notice he said they. And who's he talking about? The false prophets and I believe the false Christ. They shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even under the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. You know, I visit my ancestor's cemetery, where it's a family cemetery in a little town in central Arkansas. My great-grandfather is there. My great-grandmother, Hoggard, is there. She died at 101. Beautiful, godly lady. My dad's parents are there, and my father is there. And I like to go there and visit and reminisce and talk to the Lord and cry a little bit. But there's one thing I like about that cemetery. In fact, probably most cemeteries in the Western world is that they lay the bodies. And it's because of this verse, all of them sort of facing east, if you can lay on the ground and face east. But the idea is they don't have their back if they, were to if they were to rise up, they would be facing the east. And it's because Jesus said those words, as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth in them into the west, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, if you know anything about the Old Testament tabernacle, the one in the wilderness, and Solomon's temple, you'll note that as the priest enters into the sanctuary, he goes through the gate of the tabernacle court. He's in the east. He comes from the east, goes into the sanctuary, and as he's doing that, he's going west. That's because Jesus is the high priest, and he goes from east to west. That's why it's done that way. There was something here, though, that as I was reading it, I wanted to draw your attention to. In so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Now, as you remember, I've been giving quite a lot of attention to false doctrine, false prophets, fake news on the internet, on the television, on the radio, in the newspapers, on the blogs, in the YouTube videos, in the bit shoot videos, all over the internet, the internet has become a cesspool of false ideas, false news reports. I've fallen for some of them. You've fallen for some of them. And at some point, remember, I've always said this, at some point, you know, I like my technology. I got my phone, my tablet, my watch, 
my computers. That's how I've been most of my life. But at some point, I have to draw a line and say, no more technology. No more reading all these websites and watching all these videos. Oh, I may watch them, but I'm not going to believe a word they say unless it can be proven. And then when it comes to certain ideas, if I can't find them in scriptures, they're not real and they don't exist. And I'm not paying attention to it. To me, the Bible is everything. God, God put me to this test at the early stages of this ministry. And it goes back before 2009 when I started doing the Watchman video broadcast. 1997 is when God called me to study Bible prophecy. And if you remember, I was going to read all these books and all this stuff, and God said, no, read the Bible. I remember the Club O Prophecy, the Prophecy Club, sent a guy to St. Louis. He supposedly had these prophecies now of what was going to happen. And he predicted tanks in the streets. He predicted, I wrote down just about everything the man said. This was, this was probably be in 1998. You know, he lied about practically everything that he said, he lied. But I remember on the way out, because at the time I wasn't sure. And on the way out, shook hands with the band, there's a full crowd there, and I got in the car up in St. Louis, and I'm driving back home. And I said, Lord, you know, what he, he was a pastor. What he says sounds pretty convincing. And I remember saying this to God, God, I know that you're true and every man's a liar. And God, I don't know if this man's lying or not. And if he is, I want you to show it to me in your, in your word. If he's not lying, I want you to show it to me in your word. And my friends, we, I, you, we get caught up in all kinds. We are conspiracy theory people. And it seems like now, it's like a contest on the internet who can come up with the next conspiracy theory? Who can invent the next one? And for some bizarre reason, these people are hoping that these conspiracy theories actually take place because that would prove they were right and they were the chosen one to figure it all out. And I just quit buying that stuff. One thing I'm sure of, one thing I'm absolutely positive of is that none of God's elect, none of them are ever going to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. None of them are going to bow before a fake Jesus. None of them are going to have their DNA mingled with the fourth kingdom nation. None of them are going to lose their salvation. That is what I'm sure of. Jesus said it, what he's saying here is that it's not possible to deceive. When he says very elect, he doesn't mean, well, these people are more elect than these people. That's how we use it. The word very means, it's from Latin veritas, means true. So he's saying here, if it were possible to deceive the very elect, but it's not possible to deceive the truly elect. Now, it is quite possible that some of you watching me today are not truly elected. You believe conspiracy theories. You like some of the things I say. You hate my guts when I don't go along with some of your conspiracy theories. You're not going to believe this book over what you see on the internet, and you are going to receive a mark in your right hand and in your forehead. Because God is going to allow you to be, to be deceived. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, I've read that many times. I actually don't have it in my notes for some strange reason, but I'll bring it up here. If I can find it, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 
verse 11. Here we go. Here we go. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. And I think the strong delusion goes along with this false Christ that they should believe a lie. Now, all of us, me included, have believed lies before. I've been lied to. I've been lied to by people I thought were my friends. I've been lied to by things on the internet. I've been lied to by family members. I've been lied to by church members. I've been lied to by car salesmen. I've been lied to by just about any kind of person you can think of. But in this case here, God, just like he showed Micaiah how it happens. Micaiah, let me show you this. A spirit goes into the mouth of these 400 prophets and they all prophesy the same thing to Ahab. God wanted that lie to, to take place. He wanted Ahab to believe it. Even though Micaiah told him verbatim what had happened, Ahab didn't believe it. You see, <clears throat> you can lead some horses to water, but they'll never drink. And some people who are wrapped up in Bible prophecy and exposing and looking at conspiracy theories and all this stuff, they're going to believe the lie because they refuse. He says that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And the core of this is your sin. Now, let's, let's move on from that. It's not possible to deceive the very elect on this issue of who Christ is and who he isn't. So we have Jesus' statement to watch for people. And, and he says here, uh, there shall arise, below, if any man says, lo, here is Christ, or there believe it not, for there shall be arise false Christs, plural. That means a couple things. Number one, I think it means that throughout history, there have arisen false Christ, that I believe. And it seems to indicate here that one day you may have hundreds, maybe even thousands of people showing up saying, I am Christ. And this guy says, I am Christ. And this guy says, I am Christ. And that gal over there says, I am Christ. And see, that's the thing. If you've got one true Jesus Christ and you got a thousand counterfeits, how are you going to know the difference, right? That's what Satan does. He muddies the waters so much that you can't see anything. That's what he loves. That's why there's so many Bibles out there, different Bible translations. He's muddying the waters so that you have absolutely no idea what God actually said. You know, the people who say, well, I like to get all the translations out and look, compare them all. And, you know, somewhere in the middle, that's what God said. Yeah, but they're contradictory to one another. They're contradictory to the King James. See, he muddies the waters. Instead of one Bible, let's give them 20 different Bibles. Instead of one Christ, let's give them thousands of Christs. And people will pick one, and some people will pick another. And the devil doesn't care as long as they don't pick the real one. Okay? Now, there's backup verses to this. Matthew chapter 24, verse 5. He said it earlier. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Here is Mark's version of that same sermon that he preached. Mark chapter 13. And then if any man shall say to you, Lo, here is Christ, or lo, he is there, believe him not. For false Christ and false prophets shall rise and shall shew signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. There he says it again, if it were possible. So we know it's not possible to deceive the truly elect. But take ye heed, behold, I have foretold you all things. Amos. Amos said that. Surely the Lord doeth nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And his servants, the prophets, are all right here, people. Jesus has foretold us everything. John chapter 16, verse 12. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it? When he the spirit of truth, what is truth? Thy word is truth, is come. He will guide you into 
all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And listen to this, and he will show you things to come. So surely we have a sure word of prophecy. And as long as we stick to this book, anchor ourselves in it, let it be the guide of our heart and our soul and our thoughts and our wicked imaginations, let it be the guide to show you what is true and what is false. The sermon that YouTube took down, first one I ever had, I think, where they took it down and to my knowledge, they have yet to put it back up called truth or consequences. We're either going to know the truth or we'll pay the consequences for it. We'll believe the lie. Second Corinthians chapter 11. Now Paul's going to give us a, another, a, a, a different way of saying this, backing up what Jesus said about other Christ. Here's what Paul said. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Let me stop right here. Chaste virgin means that we haven't been with other gods claiming to be Christ. We haven't been and we're not going to go from here is Christ and you go over here. No, there is Christ and you go over there. The chaste virgin of Christ means that we haven't committed spiritual fornication or adultery against our husband, Jesus Christ the righteous. We haven't and we're not going to. But as I said, there are those out there who are, they have, they are, and they will continue to do so. They invent in their mind a Jesus that does not match the Jesus that's in this Bible. See, that's how you're going to know who's the real Jesus. And as I show you some things, I'm going to go into history and show you different Christs that have risen up. And I'm telling you, The similarities are mind-boggling. But were they really Jesus Christ? Well, the answer is no. But the similarities will fool people. Anyway, so Paul says, verse 3, But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve, we've been through that many times, through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Paul was very, you know, the Corinthian church, we know from Paul himself that he sent them four letters. Two of them we don't have, don't be looking for them. The two that mattered, the two that were the Word of God, are these two. And Paul had multiple problems out of the Corinthian church. And now he's telling these people, I know you people. I tried to tell you the real Jesus, but you didn't want to believe that. You didn't want to hear me. So, And I'm teaching you the simplicity that if you just believe Jesus Christ, believe what he said, you can be saved for all of eternity. But if somebody else comes in after me, which Paul said in the book of Acts, after I go, grievous wolves are going to enter in. And they did here. And he said, if somebody else comes in preaching another Jesus, and this Jesus with his different spirit and his other gospel, this gospel is going to be complicated. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be next to impossible, if not impossible. And that's the difference between the real Jesus and all the fake Jesuses is is that they make salvation difficult, something that nobody can keep up with, nobody can perform, nobody can handle, nobody can afford it, right? 
That's what they'd make salvation into. And so Paul says, another guy comes in, you'll believe him. I know you people, you'll believe him. And again, people, I love you. And I speak the truth in love to you, warning you that all these fantasy conspiracy theories and all of these websites and all of, these, all of this junk on the internet that you're swallowing is slowly but surely removing you away from the truth that's in this book. And I'm like Paul. I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. I'm not jealous that you're not following me. I couldn't care less. I'm jealous and worried that you'll end up following a Christ that has come out of the imagination of your heart and your mind based upon the things you see on the internet and not from the scriptures. Uh, first John. John, John is the only one, and I like this, the numbers mean something. John wrote how many books? The Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Revelation, 5. And John is the only one who mentioned the term Antichrist. Guess how many times? Guess how many times he said it? Yes, you're right, five times. 1 John 2, 18, little children, it is the last time, and as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, he said, even now are there many Antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time. That is exactly what Jesus was saying. That in the last days, many shall come saying, I am Christ. So there's going to be multiple Christs. And John says it here, even now there are many antichrists. So think of um, like the Hegelian dialect, right? Thesis, antithesis, or antithesis, like creation and evolution. Okay, those two don't go together, but they're competing ideas about the same thing which is, where did everything come from? So creation is the thesis, and evolution is its anti-thesis. It's trying to establish the same idea of where did the universe come from, but it's a completely different version of, rather than creation. Creation says God created everything in six literal days 6,000 years ago, and that's exactly what I believe. But you have anti-thesis, the antichrist. Creation created itself 13 billion years ago. But then you have the marriage of the two, which they're not compatible. When you join the two together, you have theistic evolution. See, the words just they're oxymorons, okay? They don't belong together. And it says that, yes, God created everything 13 billion years ago, which still means the Bible's wrong. Doesn't matter, the Bible's still wrong. So any version of Antichrist, no matter how much he looks like Christ, he's not Christ, and beware. 1 John 2.22, who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. There's only one. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. 1 John 4.3, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God, and this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now, already, is it in the world. And I'm going to show you what that means. Second John 1, 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. So, John has established that the spirit of antichrist, even though the antichrist right now, the beast, 
uh, the man of sin, son of perdition, all the other names the Bible gives him. We know that right now, currently, his present ad- address is 666 Fire Lake, Hades, hell. Okay, that's where he lives. He's in the pit right now, locked up down there. One of these days, he's going to be let out. But in anticipation of the day when the Antichrist is presented to the world as Jesus Christ, then the spirits, devils, already working, and they've been working for thousands of years now, to present everybody with the idea that when the Antichrist shows up, everybody except the very elect is going, there he is. So it'd be like, you know, you've seen these pictures of Jesus, right? Paintings of Jesus. You know, one on, the, uh, on some hymn books, Heavenly Highway Hymns or something like that. There's this painting of this beautiful-faced Jesus. Even though Isaiah 53 tells us that he's not comely, he's not handsome, there's nothing about his appearance that would draw us, okay? So think of it like this. The devil hands out seven billion people in the world. The devil hands out seven billion leaflets, and they all have this picture of Jesus on it. Everybody thinks, okay, that's Jesus. So the Antichrist shows up, and lo and behold, he looks exactly like the the painting, the picture. So what is most everybody going to (gasps) believe? There he is. I knew he looked like that. I have his picture right here. They're going to fall for it. They're going to believe it. They have already. The spirit of Antichrist has been working ever, ever since Genesis 3. The spirit of Antichrist has been working. The spirit of Antichrist has been working all this time in every civilization, every culture, throughout history. It's working right now and will continue to work until the day that the Antichrist, the man of sin, the beast, is revealed to mankind. But by then, mankind will accept the idea that he's not the Antichrist, he's not the devil's son, he's not the devil incarnate. He's Jesus Christ. And imagine that. Here is the Bible telling you, again, that he's not going to try to appear as Buddha, Muhammad, some other false god, false prophet, or whatever. He's going to appear as Jesus himself. So there's going to be many parts to this series. Because when I get into something and I want to dig... If I got a piece of chicken in my hand, I'm going to get everything I can off that chicken bone before I'm done with it. I'm going to try to do that with this series. Number one, to give you the background information. And number two, to warn you that even you can be deceived unless God has elected you, God has loved you, And God has already said, I'm not going to let this guy believe the lie. I hope and pray that that's you. I hope and pray it's me, right? So let's do, let's go back into history and look at some of the gods or myths or whatever of people in history that have appeared as Christ. There is a, uh, there's a documentary film, came out, I don't remember what year, years ago, and I was encouraged to watch it, and I started watching it, and I got mad. And I just, and I, and I watched it the other day, finally, all, most of the way through. I haven't finished it yet. And it starts out talking about one thing, and then ends up talking about 9-11, and all the conspiracies that went along with 9-11, like, you know, what happened to Building 7, which that's a big question in my mind. But how it started out was really what got me ticked off about it. Because it spent a lot of time, the the documentary is called Zeitgeist. It's a German word. 
And it starts out for some reason. It's going to end up talking about 9-11, but it's got to start out telling you that the Jesus that we all believe in is fake. That Christianity is actually itself based on earlier pagan religions. And some of the things that I'm going to show you are in that documentary, Zeitgeist. And why is, and I did, never did catch the, the connection. If we're talking about 9-11, let's talk about 9-11. But let's introduce the idea that everybody who calls himself a Christian and believes in a character named Jesus and that he's coming back, he died on the cross, well, you're all liars, you're all wrong, because that's nothing other than a pagan religion that's been around for thousands of years and Christianity was molded after that. That's called a setup. The devil is setting people up to believe in, remember the picture he's handed out. He's setting people up to believe that the Jesus of this Bible is an invention of man. So don't believe in, don't believe in Jesus. Whatever you do, don't believe in Jesus. That's pretty much what it's saying. So let's start with a character in the Bible that's actually referenced in historical records, a deity by the name of Tammuz. Ezekiel chapter 8. This is, and I love Ezekiel 8. Ezekiel 8 is God taking Ezekiel into secret places where the people there don't want Ezekiel or anybody else in there for that matter. It's like secret societies. They don't want common folk in there in their meetings. They don't want just anybody around. Or it's like secret meetings at the Pentagon or CIA or Area 51 or whatever. They just don't want everybody going through there looking at all their s secrets and hearing all their stuff. But God's taking Ezekiel through the temple and he's showing Ezekiel, the prophet, the things that the men who are supposed to be God's men, well, they're all liars, they're deceivers, and they're actually, actually worshiping the Antichrist. They're worshiping Baal in the house of God. So he takes him through and he shows him this and he shows him that. And then he gets to verse 13, Ezekiel chapter. By the way, in Ezekiel 9, all these people that God showed to Ezekiel, they were killed. God killed them. He doesn't tolerate false prophets and fake preachers. He doesn't tolerate that. Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 13. He said also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Now, here in a little bit, I'll show you who exactly Tammuz, or some say Tammuz, I don't know, tomato, tomato, I don't know. But anyway, I'll show you who Tammuz was. He, he is another Jesus. Why are they weeping for him? It's because he was slain. And I'll show you why he was slain in a minute. But here's where we have a connection now between a false Jesus by the, by the name of Temaz and the real Jesus who died on the cross. And if you remember, there were women at the foot of the cross weeping for Jesus who was being crucified. John chapter 19, verse 25 is one of those records that we have. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. Well, we got three Marys here. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by, whom he loved, which was John, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour the disciple took her under his own home. Now, so we know that at the foot of the cross, you have all these women. You have the mother of Jesus. You have, not the mother of God. The mother of Jesus. And you have other women who are around, Mary Magdalene and others. You have them at the foot of the cross weeping. 
lamenting for the one who was going to give his life for the salvation of the entire world, Jesus Christ. So, and I want you to think about this. Throughout history, it's like the devil foreseeing something that was going to happen, like the crucifixion of Christ for the salvation of mankind. And he sets up these different gods throughout the ages who are similar to Christ. In other words, some God who comes down to the earth like uh, the God who went to heaven and stole fire from the gods because man doesn't have fire and he doesn't know how to cook food. He's eating raw meat and stuff like that. So he goes into heaven, steals fire from the gods, brings it down to the earth and gives fire to mankind. And the gods are angry and the gods are going to kill him. And I think in this story, I can't remember, but I think in this story, um, he's laying there and a bird is eating his liver for eternity. That's a little weird. But anyway, he's a picture of what is called the dying God. Uh, there's actually a Wikipedia article on this. Manley Hall wrote about it. This idea of a God who, for the benefit of others, is sacrificed, is killed, is murdered, is slain, gives up his life for the salvation of people all over the world. The devil's been setting this up now in history for thousands of years. So you have these women in the temple of God in Ezekiel's day weeping for the god Tammuz, just like the women weeping for Jesus Christ at the cross. So why are they weeping? Here's what Manly Hall said in Secret Teachings of All Ages. The myth of Tammuz and Ishtar, does that name ring a bell? Ishtar is Ashtaroth from the Bible, Isis. And all of these words are derivative of the Hebrew word for female woman, which is Isha. We find that in Genesis. So Ishtar is his mother slash wife. Yeah. The myth of Tammuz and Ishtar is one of the earliest examples of the dying god allegory, probably antedating 4000 B.C. Again, the devil set this up thousands of years before Christ, setting up this idea of a fake Jesus. He's been working on this for a long time. The imperfect condition of the tablets upon which the legends are inscribed makes it impossible to secure more than a fragmentary account of the Tammuz rites, or Tammuz rites, being the esoteric god of the sun. I stop right here. Who is Jesus? He's the son of righteousness, arising with healing in his wings. His face shines like the sun. So Tammuz is the sun god. He is pretending to be Jesus Christ. Being the esoteric god of the sun, Tammuz did not occupy a position among the first deities venerated by the Babylonians, who for lack of deeper knowledge looked upon him as a god of agriculture or a vegetation spirit. Think of the green giant. Originally, he was described as being one of the guardians of the gates of the underworld. Like many other, notice this, savior gods. Again, this is Manly Hall, who was not a Christian. He is referred to as a shepherd or the Lord of the shepherd seat. Da, da, da. Tammuz occupies the remarkable position of son and husband of Ishtar, the Babylonian and Assyrian mother goddess. Ishtar, to whom the planet Venus was sacred. I got to stop right here. Venus is often referred to as the morning star. And of course, we know what the NIV says in Isaiah 14. It doesn't call Lucifer. Lucifer calls him morning star. Spirit of Antichrist. Anyway, to whom the planet Venus was sacred was the most widely venerated deity of the Babylonian and Assyrian pantheon. She was probably identical with Ashtaroth, Astart, and Aphrodite. 
the story of her descent into the underworld in search, presumably, for the sacred elixir, which alone could restore Tammuz to life, is the key to the ritual of her mysteries. Tammuz, whose annual festival took place just before the summer solstice, died in midsummer in the ancient month which bore his name. Uh, midsummer is June 21st, which bore his name and was mourned with elaborate ceremonies. The manner of his death is unknown, but some of the accusations made against Ishtar by Isdubar, who is Nimrod, would indicate that she, indirectly at least, had contributed to his demise. The resurrection of Tammuz was the occasion of great rejoicing, at which time he was hailed as a redeemer of his people. Are you kidding me? It's like the devil read the gospel and created his own version of Jesus Christ. I mean, there is so much here. As I'm reading this, I'm just going, this is blowing my mind. The idea that he was the shepherd or Lord of the shepherds. We're going to look at that here in a minute. By the way, let me do this. Let me, while I'm talking, let me show you the picture of Tammuz. Okay? Of course, obviously, this isn't a photograph. It's an artist's rendering of who Tammuz was. And I want you to notice things about him while I'm talking. Manly Hall said that Ashtaroth went into the underworld, went to hell, looking for the sacred elixir which could restore Tammuz to life. Now, stop right here. In our Bibles, Christ rises from the dead by the power of God his Father. He is restored back to life. Now, in the Bible, women represent churches. So in Ezekiel 8, when you have these women weeping for Tammuz, God is telling us that these are churches that are actually, right now, worshiping the Antichrist. But they don't know it. They believe he's Jesus, but he's not Jesus. Okay? He's a shepherd, but he's not our shepherd, the good shepherd the elixir. She goes into the underworld. She goes to hell because supposedly down in hell is this liquid that when she can pour it in his lips, he will instantly come back to life and he'll be resurrected from the dead. You see it? Tammuz. When he's, God shows Ezekiel these women, and that's all he says, these women weeping for Tammuz. That's all he says. But the idea was that Tammuz was a type of of the false Christ, the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition. And these women were doing it in the house of God. And I'm telling you, God's not happy about it at all. Manly Hall went on to say that he believed that Isdubar, which was Nimrod, was partly responsible for his death and that he's the redeemer of his people. Remember who Nimrod was. Genesis chapter 10. 10 is the number for dominion. And in Genesis 10, we have the first king and the first kingdom. We have the kingdom of Babel, Babylon, and her king, Nimrod, who some say was a giant. Could be. I don't know. But he also, Nimrod, was, if we count from Adam going down in generations, we know Enoch was the seventh from Adam. The Bible says that. Guess what number Nimrod was? 13. Dun, dun, dun. Now, let me go to this picture. Notice that he wears Notice that he wears a headdress. And what design is on that headdress? A cross. And remember, according to Manley Hall, this goes back 4,000 years before Christ, which would have been right after the flood, right at the time of Babylon. In fact, I think the story goes that Nimrod died, Semiramis was his wife, and 
uh, Semiramis uh, got pregnant by the soul or the spirit of Nimrod after he died, gave birth to Tammuz, and then married Tammuz. <laughs> anyway, but he's got the sign of the cross around his head, and I want you to notice that he's holding a cup. When Manley Hall mentioned earlier that Tammuz was a shepherd god, first thing I thought of, Zechariah 11, verse 17, Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. You see, the devil even set up the idea that this fake Jesus would be a shepherd. But see, God had it all figured out, didn't he? There's not anything that Satan can come up with that God doesn't know. If you remember the language of Isaiah 14, God said, For thou hast said in thine heart, he didn't say it out loud, he said it to himself, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will, I will what? I will be like the most high. So he sees in the devil's heart and he knows what he's thinking. You can't trick God. You can't cheat him. And you can't outthink him because he knows the thoughts of every man and every beast and every angel. So the devil sets up this false Christ, and he's just one of many of them, named Tammuz. We have this season. You know how long they wept for Tammuz? Forty days. Do you know that that's still being done right now? It's called Lent. And on Ash Wednesday, see, Lent is a 40-day period of mourning for Jesus Christ. Now, why do we have to mourn 40 days for Jesus Christ? Well, we don't really. But why does the Catholic Church and Lutheran Church, Presbyterian Church, Episcopalian Church, Church of England, and other churches... Why do they say that we have to weep for Jesus for 40 days? Was it 40 days from the day he died to his resurrection? Nah. It was just three. So where did they get that from? They got it from the ancient pagan idea of weeping for Tammuz. Go back to the picture of Tammuz. What has he got around his head? He's got this wrap on his head with a cross on it. What did they do on Ash Wednesday? They put a mark on people's foreheads in the form of an ashen cross, just like Tammuz. Do you see anywhere in the Bible where God tells us that we have to let somebody write a cross on our forehead with ashes? No. And by the way, do ashes represent Jesus in any way, shape, or form? Was he burned up? Was he turned to See, ashes, we say ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Um, Abraham said, though I be but dust and ashes. Dust and ashes are the remains of a body that's either decomposed or has been burned. And the Bible says of Jesus that God did not allow his Holy One to see corruption. While his body laid in that tomb, he never rotted, never corrupted, didn't turn to dust or ashes. It's a setup. And people who don't know their Bible just go along with whatever the priest or the minister tells them to do, and they do it. And what they're doing is that they're worshiping the idol shepherd, literally a Jesus statue. And God hates idols. So you have the idol shepherd... Tammuz, the fake Jesus, Isaiah 40, verse 11, the real shepherd. 
He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm. By the way, go, you can do this on YouTube. Find YouTube, Handel's Messiah, he shall feed his flock. To me, Handel's Messiah, there's no greater mingling of scripture and music than Handel's. I just happen to like it. But the little chorus, he shall feed his flock. Go to YouTube or somewhere, Spotify or wherever you get your music from and listen to that. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. John chapter 10, verse 11, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Notice back in Isaiah 40, it says, He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom. Now, this is real simple. When you have a fake shepherd, the idle shepherd, means it's a statue. Does he carry the sheep in his arms? No. In fact, the sheep have to carry him in their arms. See it? Always in the devil's religion, the people have to do for their God. In ours, God does it all for us. Isn't that beautiful? The idle shepherd has to be carried by the sheep. The good shepherd carries the sheep. We're not walking our way to heaven, running our way to heaven, flying our way to heaven, working our way to heaven. We're being carried by the good shepherd who gives his life for his sheep. Amen. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-five. 25, after the same manner also he took the cup. This deals with that cup. Remember, women represent the church, right? So, let's say that Ashtaroth or Isis or Semiramis, whoever, Tammuz' mother wife, she has to go to the underworld, get the elixir of life, the fountain of youth, whatever, the, the holy grail, whatever you call it, she has to resurrect the dying or the dead God. In our version of it, Christ resurrects himself by the power of God and he gives us life, not the other way around. You see how easy it is to figure this out? All you got to do is turn it 180 degrees, flip it upside down, and you got it. That's the devil's religion. That's what Paul was saying. I'm showing you the simplicity of Christ. Christ carries you like a lamb in his bosom. He'll carry you into glory. He'll give you life. He'll raise you from the dead. But in their religion, it's up to us to raise that God from the dead. Mm. So the cup... There's always a cup in religions, always. Even in, the, even in Freemasonry, secret societies, there is this idea that you must drink the God and eat the God, consume the God in some way so that you have the God inside of you. In Catholic uh, the Catholic doctrine and some other Protestant religions is called transubstantiation, which means that the priest literally says hocus pocus and he turns the wafer and the wine into the literal body and blood of Jesus Christ. Now, what's wrong with that? God told us not to drink blood, and God told us not to eat food sacrificed to idols. So, there is the real cup of Christ, which is our salvation. And then there's this other cup. And I submit to you that something, somehow, some way, the religion of the Antichrist will set up this cup, this holy grail. Those who drink of it, those who partake of it, 
I believe are sealed and doomed for eternity. I think somehow, some way, that is related to receiving the mark of the beast. So in 1 Corinthians 11, 25, after the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. So what is the cup that we drink? This. We drink it, we eat it, our soul does, not our flesh, our soul does. This is the, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. 1 Corinthians 10, 16, the cup of blessing which we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Psalm 116, 13 sheds light on all this. I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. So here is the cup. Now, we also, just like in baptism, water baptism shows on the outside what God, the Holy Ghost, has done on the inside of us. Water baptism was never seen anywhere in the scripture as being the necessity for salvation or what actually saves us. It's just a manner of showing the world this is what's been done. Also, when we partake of the communion, we literally drink the cup, new wine, no leaven. We eat the unleavened bread. Does that save us? No, we're already saved. We have partaken of the cup and the blood and the body of the New Testament, the scriptures. But what we do is we show on the outside what we have already believed on the inside. Amen? You see, no way, when, when, uh, Nic when Nicodemus asked Jesus, how can I be born again? He said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He said it was belief. And that belief is our soul partaking of the Lord's cup. Look at this. Look what I found. See these pictures? These are different religions throughout history. All of them have a cup of the gods. The gods have this cup, this elixir. In some cases it's in heaven, in some cases it's in hell. And this cup is to be given to the devotees and they drink of the cup and they believe that that gives them immortality. They believe it gives them life. They believe it gives them nirvana. They believe whatever. But actually what it is, it's the cup of devils. 1 Corinthians 10, 21. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. You see, that's why I believe what I believe. I believe just as Christ has a cup and a table of the bread of life, the blood of Jesus Christ, the Word of God. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Just as Christ has a cup and a table, so does the Antichrist. It's called the cup of devils, literally. It doesn't just belong to the devils. It contains the devils. Just like the cup of Christ contains Christ. And the table of Christ contains Christ. So does the table of the devils and the cup of devils. Look in Jeremiah 51, 7. Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. It means they're crazy, out of their mind. Ezekiel 23, 33, Thou shalt be filled with the drunkenness and sorrow with the cup 
of astonishment and desolation with the cup of thy sister Samaria. Revelation 17, 4, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. See, literally, her cup contains blood. Now, in Acts 15, and, and I referenced this just a little while ago, the Jerusalem Council met to answer this question of, do the Gentiles have to keep the law to be saved? Like, you know, be circumcised, you know, like keep the feast days and all that stuff. They met, they talked. There was no Pope here. Peter wasn't in charge. Peter said, I will say I'm the vicar of Christ and I will speak ex cathedra and I will tell you what all to believe. None of that happened. Paul, Peter, James, the disciples, you got elders, you got people from the church, and nobody's really in charge here except the Holy Ghost. And they went back and forth and they gave their reasons why they think one way or the other. And James finally said, guys, here we are Jews. We're trying to tell the Gentiles to keep the law. We didn't keep the law. So why should we make them do it? But they did come up one, two, three, four. Four things that they should do. They should tell the Gentiles to do. So in verse 19, wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. And then when they wrote the letter, they wrote it like this. In verse 25, it seemed good unto us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from meats. Meats is anything you eat. In, in the Bible definition, meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled like anything hanging from a tree uh, and from fornication. Four specific things that the Jerusalem Council, Council told us Gentiles to stay away from. And three of them have to do with ingesting food that was offered in front of an idol, like at the Catholic Mass or other Protestant religions that believe transubstantiation or consubstantiation. That means, transubstantiation means that the Catholic priest turns it literally into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. They literally believe that's Christ. If you ever watched a Catholic priest perform a mass, they're very careful, not because they believe any crumbs that come off of that when they break that bread, that that crumb is a piece of the body of Jesus and they pour it into the cup. They even have a special room where the priest, after the mass, disrobes. It's called the sacristy. I learned this. Because when the priest goes in the sacristy, sacristy, when he takes his robes off, he might have a speck of that body of Jesus on his garments. And that has to be treated in a certain way. And the reason why I know this is that Cardinal George Pell in Australia, that's where he molested the boys that were in the choir. He was sentenced, he was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison for like 20 years, but the judge knew he was going to die anyway. And the Australian Supreme Court all of a sudden overturned his conviction and let him free. You don't think there's spiritual wickedness in high places? But that's what they literally believe. Consubstantiation means that the body and the blood are literally with the wafer and the wine that they drink. It's basically the same idea, a little difference in the language. 
They still believe that they're drinking blood. They still believe that they're eating something that in many cases, even in Protestant churches, the only one that I went to in this county had a great big, ten, it must have been 10 foot tall statue of Jesus sitting on a throne up on the stage. It was, they called him the good shepherd. And the priest comes in, the Lutheran priest comes in reading and bowing and praying prayers to this idol. And then breaking the bread and offering the communion in front of it. And God said, no, don't do it. So you see the difference now. With the fake Jesus, the other Jesus, will always come the other gospel. So today I'm going to ask you, which one will you believe in? Will you believe the Jesus of this Bible? Will you partake of his cup, which is this New Testament? Will you partake of the table of the Lord, which is the Word of God? Or is your mind right now being in the process of being corrupted by all the fallacies, the heresies, the subtle false doctrines, and the false lies and the false teachings that are on the internet. Because if you do and you let your mind get corrupted subtly by Satan, you will end up drinking the cup of devils and eating from their table. You'll be weeping for Tammuz, the idle shepherd. You will defile the temple of God. And one of these days, you'll receive the mark on your right hand or your forehead. I am imploring you people, turn back to this book. Turn back to the Bible. Turn back to King James Bible and no other. Partake of that cup, eat from that table, and you will be assured that you're the elect of God and God will not let you be deceived by the false Christ. Now I've got much more. But today, I just want you to get back to the book, drink the cup of Christ. Will you do that? You're the reason why I do what I do. I love you. Thank you so much for your prayers for us and our ministry and our labor and our work. Pray for the people of Kenya. Pray for our ministry. Pray for people around the world and pray that God won't let the devil mislead you so that you end up eating from the cup or drinking from the cup of devils and eating from their table. This is Pastor Mike. God bless you. I love you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.